I'm delighted to be joined here by David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you. Um, we've talked about lots of things here today, and some of the things that keep coming up are, actually, they, they keep coming up because I keep bringing them up, so um, uh, this sense of polarization in, in the media and polarization in society. And I, and I was reading, I've got it here, um, the excellent piece on the future of the press by Jill Lepore, which was in The New Yorker a few months ago. Right. And she quoted Alan Rusbridger, uh, the former editor of The Guardian, saying uh, that social media had heightened a social divide of sorts. And uh, he said, chaotic information uh, is free, <laughs> good information is increasingly expensive, which meant that good information is increasingly for smaller elites. Do, do you agree with I, that I, suggestion? I don't wholly. I think it's, you know, I, when I was, um, when the web, the internet started to show its muscle and to present itself, I made it a point, any time I got invited to a, um, some sort of event, some evening where people were going to discuss the ins and outs of the internet and the news business and all the rest, to accept the invitation, and I knew why I was being invited. I was some sort of, you know, dinosauric um, uh, editor at a magazine that represented by a guy in a top hat and a, and a monocle. I, I, I knew my role. New place. Right. Yeah. I, w I was going to be the Stegosaurus at the petting zoo. <laughs> and I did nothing but learn and learn and learn by these evenings, and everybody was a, a bit younger or a lot younger. And there were many things said in those evenings that turned out to be absolutely true. But there also turned out to be things said that were absolute nonsense. Number one, nobody will read anything online that's longer than 400 words. Mm. Nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. I, how many people do you sit next to on the subway reading not just New Yorker pieces, but even things slightly longer like Anna Karenina? Mm -hmm. It happens. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was said all the time was information wants to be free. Well, the impulse of that was information wants to get around, it wants to be fluid, it wants to have a, a, a fluidity in, in international terms and maybe interplanetary terms and all the rest. Hmm. But what was not taken into this kind of evangelical uh, terminology of the internet was that there's, there is, as Alan says, hmm. information that's good information an information that's crap, that's false, that's a lie, that's underreported, that's not fact-checked, much less spell-checked, whatever. There's a lot of that. So Alan is absolutely right mm. that in order to cover the war in Sudan or City Hall or the complexities of a presidential camp campaign or incipient authoritarianism all over Europe and the rest of the world, much less in the United States, that's expensive. Mm. It requires people of skill, training, editors, travel budgets. Yes, things can be do, done in, in a new way, in a different way, and there are economies that, that can be made. I'm co told that constantly by my corporate overlords. But um, <laughs> uh, information that's provided uh, from a foreign country by a correspondent who speaks the language and knows something mm. and knows how to write or to broadcast or to edit as opposed to somebody who knows nothing and is writing it uh, off the top of his or her head is immensely different. So I, I think that that's number one. Number two, uh, on the question of it's for smaller and smaller, no. Because I, look, information, even good information, can cascade, to use the cor corporate term. Right. At this point in the United States, which is a country of 300 odd million people, almost everybody knows who Harvey Weinstein is. And I don't think it's because of Shakespeare and love. Mm. The collected circulations of the New York Times and the New Yorker magazine, which did that story, I don't know, five million? I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's immensely less than the number of people who now know at least the crux of the story mm. that led to the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. So information has a way of uh, getting around. Right. Well, elite media produces the report, does the reporting. I, mean, I use elite advisedly. Uh, 
and it spreads because of it, because of the quality of the story, or because the story has punch and impact, and it makes people sit It spreads for all kinds up. of reasons. Right. It spreads because of the quality of the reporting. It spreads because we have the technological means to do it. Right. We have even the te technological means to steal it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is another subject that I'm sure was discussed uh, yeah. all day long. I mean, that story, the, the Weinstein story, had huge impact, mm -hmm. and people, you know, as you say, it, it Cultural, spread like well. Yeah. Social, sexual, yeah. social, yeah. Um, political. We were talking earlier uh, about whether the the press has lost lost any. There's been a waning of power in the press, uh, and I, I mentioned the, the you know the, for, for those of us my age the sort of who see this period as a particular heyday, but the early 70s and you know Watergate and the Pentagon Papers and things things happening as a consequence of uh, politically as a consequence of reporting and, and quality, quality journalism. It, Do you think look, that, is, look, is that, old, is that the, less the old, that the old model was David Halberstam, 29-year-old reporter, is in Saigon, and he starts to realize that he's being lied to by generals and politicians and starts to send dispatches back into the New York Times saying, this is a lot of hogwash. Hmm. The old model is Rachel Carson in the pages of The New Yorker tells us that, in fact, DDT is maybe not good for the bloodstream. And that report, which reaches several hundred thousand people, flows out into the bloodstream of the media so that Walter Cronkite eventually gets up on the air on CBS Evening News and speaks to tens of millions of people that the Vietnam War is a fiasco. Mm. And what happened it, gradually, and before technology even, so th there were alternate institutions that grew up alongside of this. Mm. For example, there was the rise of the counter-establishment during the Reagan administration, both in academia and in media, where you saw the rise of conservative institutions. Mm. And that's, a, that's one story. And then, of course, technology provides you with other instruments. And it's never been used with more uh, bluntness and force and impeccable finesse than by the President of the United States, mm. which is to say Twitter. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm being incredibly wry by saying, by, by Orwellian means. Yeah. We have a President who does not hesitate to say um, that the truth is false and falsity is truth. And mm. it's straight out of the pages of 1984. And it's immensely difficult to combat and journalists tie themselves up into knots about whether they should use the word lie or not lie, or it, it, because we're, we're, for years, grew up in a certain kind of understanding. Mm. We all knew that presidents and politicians lie, but we didn't know that the privilege would be abused at such a scale. Mm. So how do, we, how do we deal with that? Mm. It's a very serious set of problems that, that are presented. Do you think that the, the press in this country has got it right with the way it has covered Trump? Well, what's the press? Is yeah. the press what Dean Baquet is running at the New York Times and Marty Barron is at the Post and what, what it's at in the Financial Times? Mm. Or is it Breitbart News? Mm. Or is it Facebook? Or is it or, or, or? What is it? Mm. You have to, I think, I think you can't say there's this thing called the media or the well, press. Well, in, in the, the, the Jill... I don't, I don't mean to be picky. You no, no, I understand what you mean. It's a distinction with a difference. But the, the, so, some corners of the press, I won't, won't, right. won't have to go into which ones, have been quite adversarial. Combative, in the you way you can say which ones you mean. I... Uh, Us, sure. No, no, no. I was, I was thinking about uh, about. Well, I guess I guess you CNN have been pretty com pretty punchy. I think I don't mind saying. Look, the, uh, the cover Times of the New Yorker, we, we we satirize for what what good it might or might not do. Yes, yeah. Uh, the president of the United States, and I think that's you know that's been, been a role of the press since you know. Thomas Nast caricaturing Boss Tweed. Yeah, it's yeah. not new. But do you think that that. Uh, Sort of that helps generally. I mean, in, in the same Jill Lepore piece, she says, "The more adversarial the press, the more loyal Trump's followers become. The more broken American public life." Do you? Do you do well, you agree I with think that? it's a complicated subject because, yeah. again, what's the press? Right. I think that it's very important when when we're writing a a news report or a a uh, let's say a foreign piece from Moscow mm. or Washington or, or what have you. That is a different set of requirements, not in terms of true and false and accurate or inaccurate, a different set of requirements than an individual columnist saying, I think X, right? right? 
So if, if um, uh, Jane uh, Mayer is writing a piece about the Koch brothers, um, it is incumbent upon Jane and the whole operation to make sure that we're going to incredible lengths to hear from the Koch brothers mm. or their representatives and not just their critics. Mm. Um, so there are different kinds of journalism, different forms. Um, certain, in, certain institutions, certain publications allow more of a direct point of view than others. Mm. I would presume that the, the folkways of, of the Financial Times front page um, is different from the way uh, you, Breitbart views itself right. or even the New York Times on the margins. There, these debates go on. So I don't, look, let's, let's be frank. People here are sophisticated about the press. There's no um, um, code of, of, of behavior. There's, mm. no, there's no Bible, there's no Ten Commandments of, of how this has to work. I, got, I grew up in the Washington Post newsroom, and there were certain understandings of things that you did and did not do, and the lengths that you went to, and all the rest. But the idea that there are rules about every single one of it, I think, is, is, um, is just not quite accurate. What about the, the, the readers or, or the viewers? and the sense that they may be coming sort of numb to a lot of this, or, or tuning out a lot of the things they read, particularly about the political coverage. To, uh, to I was thinking think specifically you know, we hear, about the, we, about the we New hear the statistics. Yeah. We hear the statistics about confidence in the media being low. I, I, I've been at this for a while. Yeah. I don't remember the statistics showing that the confidence in the media were ever soaringly high. <laughs> I, I, there were a lot of people who hated yeah. The idea of oppositional press about Vietnam and Watergate, which was the real breakthrough, mm. at least in contemporary terms, moment. Yeah, things changed at that point, didn't they? I mean, well, the, 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 there became more institutions. Yeah. There became more voices. I don't think this is necessarily bad. Mm. It's just a hell of a lot more complicated. And it's a situation that the President of the United States, if we're going to be very contemporary about it, has exploited to the maximum. Mm. Look, I, my salad days were in Moscow. I lived in, in Moscow in what we now call as the good old days, 1988 to the end of the... I, I basically left the day the Soviet Union collapsed. Yeah. Um, take no causal con, you know, uh, conclusion from that. Before things got really bad. It, it really yeah. did. <laughs> and you know, so the phrase, vrag naroda, enemy of the people, mm. this is a, Stalin, a Stalinist phrase. Mm. It was used during Robespierre's time as well in French. And so this is extraordinarily ugly what's going on and it's not to be underestimated. I, I don't think if you're being honest about the description of our contemporary times you can soft pedal yeah. the seriousness of having a president of the United States who not only reflects a, um, assertive ignorance of the facts or who or or lies about them, but insists that the media does as well. Mm. And when the media tells the truth, in factual terms, um, exerts every, every lever he has mm. to uh, undermine it. Mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking specifically about stories which in another time would have been bombshells, like the Times, the Times tax expose, sure. you know, years of work multiple pages, incredible revelations, and within a day or two I, days, I, I agree with you that, that it vanished it, from it, the nice cycle. I think even those of us who work in this every day mm. um, have to guard against exhaustion. Right. Have to guard against, this is, a, remember the phrase that we all said two years ago, or those of us who were inclined to say, nor, normalization meme? Yeah. Well, that's exactly what's happened. What, in order to get from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, in order to live your life and pick up your kids and buy a quart of milk and do all the things that you, you know, enjoy an evening, God forbid, you psychologically begin to normalize the craziness all around you. Mm. Otherwise, you can't get from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. You go out of your mind. Mm. That's hard. Mm. On the other hand, you cannot allow that to happen to such a degree that we wake up and we live in an, a, a, a political culture that's permanently despoiled. Mm -hmm. That's as dangerous in its way as what we're doing to the air and the um, uh, seas that we depend on. Mm. It's as serious as all that. Mm. And there's an entire economy built around it, and it, it, it's not just one guy. It's not one hilarious-seeming 
blowhard. Mm. It's, it, it is a international tendency that you see everywhere, of, almost, almost everywhere of consequence. Mm. And the United States leadership has given permission to other countries and its leaderships to do this. Mm. This is extraordinarily serious. So I understand the, 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 the numbing effect. You're absolutely right. But it's part of our jobs to resist it. Mm. Is, do, it's, 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 it's hard. Is, is Trump's I mean, genius, I say genius in quote marks, is, the, is, is his genius to, to, to do this, to flood the, the airwaves and the, you know, the cyberspace with tweets to, to create that numbness? Or, or, is, or is it to realize actually most people don't really care that much? And that's, that's, what, that's what, I, why I, they're I tuned out. I, I think it's condescending to say, and I, don't mean, I know you don't mean to be that, but, but it is something to think about. Mm. Most people, life is tough. Yeah. Life is just difficult. People are sick. Um, your work is difficult. You, you lost your job. You, you're, somebody in your family is having a diff Life is difficult. Mm. Life ain't no joke, mo a lot of the time. And to have to concentrate on this very complex set of concerns that we call politics, mm. and to have an intimate understanding of it, for a lot of people is, uh, is complicated and difficult and not desirable mm -hmm. and exhausting. Mm. And Trump depends on this. Yeah. Trump depends on, uh, on that. The, part of the drama of the coming election will be to what degree does he succeed in sustaining the attentions, the affections, and the loyalties of people who voted for him saying, you know what, I, am, I just want to blow it up. I just, I, I, I know he's a jerk in some way, or I know he's dishonest in this way. I know his business seems shady to me. I don't like the way he behaves with women. I know he doesn't tell the truth all the time, but all the same, I accept that. I just don't like her, hmm. and I certainly don't like Washington. I want to blow up. Yeah. Can he sustain their uh, attentions and loyalties, or has he worn them out, or has he betrayed them? It seems to me, independent of who the Democrats put forward, mm. a huge part of the drama of 2020. Mm. With everything that's going on with, I mean, you've been editor for 21 years? Well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel, and given what else is happening in the rest of the media, yeah, the rest of the media, are you optimistic about the future of of, of the business, the future of the media, the, the news media? I'm, in, I'm optimistic about the enterprise of journalism. Right. I'm optimistic that there will be talented, smart, idealistic, committed people who will want to do this activity. Yeah. And who see it as fun, as a way to see the world, a way to understand the world, and that, it, that they have some sense of civic uh, commitment, that there's a sense of idealism. I, I really, I see, talk to young would-be journalists all the time. We hire people as uh, uh, assistants and fact checkers and all kinds of entry or semi-entry jobs or, or middle-level jobs that really want to do this thing or want to write right away. I, I see no shortage of that. What we're living through is this enormous disruption of the economy yeah. of journalism. And the thing that worries me the most, it seems that a lot of the, at least some of the very, you, you, your term for it was the elite institutions, have, are finding a way. The New Yorker is finding a way because we have a really loyal readership that's, that's growing and that's willing to pay a real subscription price. That was not the old model uh, of magazines. Magazines used to be extremely cheap to subscribe to and there was, you know, the post Second World War consumerist boom and there were ads everywhere and their, their television was just in its beginnings mm. and it was a different economy. We have a different, and, and, uh, so the New Yorker will find its, its way, the New York Times is finding its way, the journal, you'll find it, et cetera. What I really worry about is this, in this enormous country, in cities like Dayton, Ohio, or even Dallas, Texas, or you know, cities, substantial cities, and, and to, let alone uh, rural areas, who's, doing, who's putting the dishonest mayor in jail there? Mm. 
right? Yeah. I grew up in New Jersey. Can we hear from New Jersey? No? Yeah. OK. Yeah. You're either exhausted or dispirited. New Jersey That's in the house, journalism. making themselves heard here. Yeah, journalism in the house, two yes. people in the back. Yeah. Every mayor of Newark, New Jersey, when I was growing up, went to jail. Huh. Every single one of them. Hugh Adnizio, Ken Gibson, Sharp James, until Cory Booker came along. Yeah. And journalism had a lot to do with that. Yeah. And you could say the same with, I don't know how many cities, judges, you know, rotten doctors, all, all the things that afflict any mm. society. When you see thousands and thousands of journalism jobs disappear, mm. when you see endless numbers of newspapers and other media outlets either die or shrivel, you have to ask yourself, what's taking their place? Now, if there were in those cities incredibly innovative, aggressive, wonderful, digital replacements of those things, then, you don't, then you would say, well, you know, blacksmiths and horseshoes disappeared, but they were replaced by this other thing. Yeah, yeah. That hasn't happened yet. There are exceptions. I just read a piece about a very interesting journalism activity in, in, in New Haven. Mm. But it, that's an exception. So we're in this period where a lot of places are screwed, and the New York Times is just not going to cover City Hall mm. in Dayton, Ohio. It can't. In fact, where is it diminishing its forces most? Mm. New York City, mm. because it's more and more a national enterprise. Yeah. So what happens in those places? The dishonest mayor stays yeah. in his or her seat. Mm. Journalism matters. Mm. Journalism has any number of purposes. It can entertain, it can bring a community together through you know, publicizing the town picnic or covering the high school football game. It covers things from day to day, but its primary highest goal has to be putting pressure on power. Mm. Financial power, political power. Mm. If we don't have that, judicial power, um, in the world of the intellect as well, if that suddenly is diminished and reduced, we are a much lesser society. Mm. And we see it. Mm. We see it happening. I spent four years in Moscow. It was absolutely wonderful. People had not been able to say anything for decades and decades. In fact, you could argue millennia. Mm. Suddenly, it cracked open, glossed. It wasn't just a word. Suddenly, there, were, there was real journalism, movies, arts, everything. Mm. To see that flowering is the opposite of what we're seeing in Russia now and what's threatened all over the world. Mm. Journalism matters intensely. It's not a matter of just business plans and subs and all the things that we have to discuss endlessly in our boring meetings with decks on the wall and all mm. the things. It, it is an activity that matters. Mm. Mm. And I think people, I think people want to do it. Um, and they want to do it well, and we have to figure out how that, that's an important part of us. So to that point, a, a question from Dan John. We have this thing. You know, you're Dan, Dan Johnson. Johnson. Dan Johnson. The audience can submit questions. Mm. Uh, hasn't Trump just copied Putin's playbook of communications, creativity, slash chaos? Well, up to a point, Lord mm. Copper. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, no, it's not the same. Mm. It's just not. I, I, it's very important to... Uh, sound alarms when alarms need to be sounded. And I think that's certainly the case where Trump is concerned and the press. But if you, here's what's different. If you go on television in Russia, particularly television, where 95 and upwards percent of people get their news, you will not hear a critical word heard about Vladimir Putin at all. You're having Don Lemon yeah, come still, later. Yeah. I don't think that's the case on CNN or yeah. MSNBC, or yeah. even, by the way, or even Fox. Yeah. Or even Fox during the day. Yeah. <laughs> during the day, yeah. At night, it's a little. By the way, we invited Fox to come. We invited Fox to come to this today, and they, they, they said no. But, uh, yeah. They were busy. Yeah. 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 But you you. Can I answer the question? Yeah, 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 I think so. Well, he says the difference is Trump will pass, and the new system is stronger in the West. And well, you know, the Russians have been at it for longer. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and Putin's levers on power are uh, more absolute than, thank God, uh, this president or any other president. It, yeah. What, what does the post-Trump yeah, media when, landscape look, look like? What then? happened the other day? Yeah. The president of the United States tweets that AT&T yeah. should exert pressure on CNN. Yeah. 
Now, in Russia, he wouldn't tweet it. He would just call up the guy at AT&T and say, and, and the guy at AT&T would already know. Yeah. That's why he's the head of AT&T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or AT&T Ski, or yeah, whatever. AT&T Ski. I, yeah. yeah, that's good. Um, so the understandings of what normalcy is yeah. get eroded to, in, in a totalitarian or an authoritarian state, get eroded to such a degree that everybody knows what their role is, mm. and anybody who defies it is called a dissident. Yeah. We are not at that stage yet. Right. Uh, so you're not entirely pessimistic. This, you sound quite I live, optimistic. I, I live and cherish and cradle my optimism. This is good. This is good. Yeah. Uh, and the red light is flashing cruelly, uh, but I'm glad to end on an optimistic note. I'm yeah, so glad you could join us. Thank that you was very much. That was the one you got. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.